because I, like a good girl, took only two minutes and <laughs> rest took more time, so I thought, you know, I must also speak. Sure. All right. First of all, coming to the question that you've answered, there's this Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, TRI. It came up with a white paper on 22nd February 2019. And it has very categorically said that 5G is going to be deployed in India in 2020 along with the world. So we have no option. It is said by TRI, so we are going to have it, and TRI is a government authority, right? Secondly, coming to the regulations. Now, as far as regulations are concerned, since we don't have any uniform regulation, say, for example, IPR policy, we don't have a single IPR policy as such to deal with whether with 4G or with 5G or with anything else. So there are different kinds of platforms which are coming up with IPR policy. Like, for example, YouTube has its own IPR policy, right? Now we have these OTTs, for example, Netflix is coming up. Uh, the others, uh, uh, I mean, whatever, something like Netflix. They have, uh, since we don't have single censorship policy, they are coming with their own censorship policies. So we have the two, the one question which is important for us to deal with at the moment is, if there is no uniform censorship policy, if there is no uniform IPR policy, then can we have diverse policies? Because if we have diverse policies, that is definitely going to certain uncertainty and unpredictability. But then just because we are scared of uncertainty and unpredictability, does it mean that we are not going to have uh, diverse policies? These are the questions that I think we must deal with. Because uh, when we are talking about regulations, when there's no uniform regulation, we have to have diverse regulation. We have to keep our mind open to it because 5G is coming. Now, what is 5G? That is one big question, right? Now, as far as my understanding goes, I'm not a science person. I'm basically a law person, so I think from the legal angle. As far as 5G is concerned, see, as I said, 1G with 1G came our mobile phones. With 2G came SMS. With 3G came internet. With 4G came speed. What is coming with 5G? With 5G, to give a few examples, we have virtual reality coming up. We have augmented reality coming up. Now, if I talk about virtual reality, that means that I am giving a lecture here and similar kind of a lecture has to be given in Japan, right? So my 3D figure is there in Japan. I'm not traveling there, so I'm going to lose all my travel. I'm going to lose probably some money also which they're going to give me. So what is going to happen? It might lead to unemployment. Like, for example, when we talk about performers, you know, why we had these performers' rights which came up was because when performers gave their performance on the stage, then what happened, people made a video recording of it, and next time they wouldn't call you because they said, we have a performer here. So that led to performers' unemployment, and they started talking about their rights. So probably the same thing is going to happen with 5G. Because when you have virtual reality, when you have augmented reality, maybe we will not be required at certain places. I don't know how many of you have heard about that Pokemon game. That's basically an augmented reality with 5G, right? Now what this does is you have a mobile phone in your hand and you see the figure here and suddenly, you know, on that, in this hall, you find Pokemon there. It has happened with me, so I know. So there was a child who went under my legs and I'm asking him, what are you looking for? And he said, auntie, there's a Pokemon there. And I was scared. I said, how come a Pokemon has come here? And that's how I realized 5G is working and you're talking about augmented realities. Somebody talked about surgeries. We will have tele-surgeries which are present, uh, you know. So sur surgery taking up with 5G. Now we must, we've all heard about, you know, these are going to lead to a lot of legal issues. Suppose we have autonomous cars, driverless cars. And these driverless cars are going to talk to each other. There's a communication which is present because there's a sensor system which is present. Now suppose these cars collide, some sensor goes wrong somewhere, and there's an accident which takes place. Who's going to be liable? The owner of the car? The one who used 5G and got into this autonomous car? Or somebody else, I don't know. So these are some of the issues which uh, so we have the, uh, you know, these liability issues coming up. We also have environmental issues coming up because since, uh, to my understanding as a lawyer, if 5G is having a higher frequency, then we need more towers for it. 
And if we need more towers for it, that means that every, now we have less towers, then we will have more towers. So when we have more towers, is it going to lead to some environmental problem? So are we going to connect ecology, environment, liability, uh, IPR issues, all have to be talked, uh, I mean, all have to be seen in totality. And since I talked about copyright, you know, because uh, that was missing there, and copyright is close to my heart, the moment you're talking about connectivity of devices, somebody said connectivity of devices, connectivity of IoT uh, techniques, technologies. So when all these get connected, businesses get connected, data starts flowing. So we are not only going to have a data tunnel, we are going to basically talk about should, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong in having a data tunnel because it's free, freely available for all. Are we going to talk about development or are we going to talk about privacy? Our Supreme Court has said privacy is a fundamental right. Very good, privacy is a fundamental right. But then isn't data required for further development also? So are we going to keep data free? As uh, I think somebody said here, democratization of data. That's the term which I really liked, which you used. So is democratization of data which is required or protection or proprietary right in data is required? So these are debates which are very, very important, but 5G is coming, sir, and this is what 5G stands for. So, uh, and, uh, so for me, I think uh, the issues are, and coming to uh, what you've said here, FRAND licensing, for example. Now, can we really have global uh, licensing policy? No, I don't think it is really possible. Because yes, unless and until you put it under WTO. Because WTO, uh, the difference between WIPO and WTO has been WIPO is a recommendatory body and WTO has been a mandatory, you know, creating mandates on you. So either we really go in for mandates or we simply go for recommendations. So this would depend upon country to country, how they basically see things. And as far as our country is concerned, looking to front licensing and SCP, uh, it's basically, it's left to individuals to determine FRAND. FRAND is basically fair, reasonable, whatever, and anti-discriminatory policies that you're talking about. So should the two parties, you know, if you talk about market, should the two people, the licensor and the licensee, should they not be left free? One answer, capitalistic answer may be, yes, they have to be left free. And if they have to left free, but the control on them is FRAND. If control is FRAND, somebody has to determine what is FRAND, and that is left to the judiciary. And judiciary has territorial, uh, you know, uh, boundaries. So when you have territorial boundaries, can we really go in for global friend and ACP? Is it just to talk in the conference or can we have it? It's I think impossible to have uh, uniform licensing policies looking to the various kinds of you know economies and the countries, political countries that we have. It will be difficult for us to deal with uh, these kinds of situations. So I think yes, as rightly said, 5G is here. So from here, we have to move on to what are the dilemmas and what are the debates uh, which are possible and what exactly 5G is. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chawla. Um, I think the, the question that I, you know, sort of uh, posed before the panel is how do we see the transition happening? I mean, since the 5G is, is there, you know, sort of knocking, um, and 2020 of this, the deployment plan, what are the areas that we're going to use 5G for? Um, you know, that's maybe... Um, I can take can, yeah, that sure. question. <coughs> As I said earlier, 5G will be given to you. I think there's, there's a unanimous understanding here in the in the audience as well as in the panel that yes, probably that is the way it is going to be as it has been going on earlier. How we are going to have this in, in India, let's be very specific to India, India context. There are two ways to address it. One, you know, in, uh, you see the possibility plus or opportunity minus. I think these are the two thoughts th that come to my mind. What are the pol possibilities that 5G brings to you on the table? Now, it is very important to know who is the actor who is going to be use, uh, using this for their benefit. Now, actors are citizens, industries, academia, entrepreneurs, um, government for that matter. These are the people who are going to use new technology or 5G uh, for their benefit. Now, if, if I'm talking about, and it is only opportunity, opportunity plus, uh, if I'm talking about smart cities, so what smart cities today have is that they have deployed huge amount of 
smart solutions across the length and breadth of the city. And I'm not talking about the physical infrastructure, I'm talking about technology infrastructure. But 5G is directly going to be relating to the technology. Now, these infrastructure have been deployed and they have been working in a manner they have been designed, whether it is designed individually at each individual locations or, or differently, that's not the important point. Point is, they have been deployed and they are expected to deliver certain output out of their function. What 5G is going to bring in is the efficiency of a communication, efficiency of connected business, efficiency of how you can relate back to the citizen aspirations. We talk about enhancing the aspiration of the citizen and how do we enhance it? We enhance it by virtue of giving him or her a better service. 5G here will become very important, I'll tell you why. Technologically, 5G will mean that it will have almost about 1,000 base station in a square kilometer area. Unlike 4G, which has very few. I think this is one change. While it brings hazards and other aesthetic issues or different complications, that's one part of it. But when it brings, what it actually means is that in that cell, you can communicate more efficiently because 5G is about efficient, uh, bandwidth speed. It will, it will be in the range of about 20 Gbps. That is the speed that we are talking about in 5G, which means, just imagine, hypothetically, uh, that, that's not the case going to be, but let me say hypothetically, autonomous cars, CSV, that we call it. You are going to have sensor across the cities. Now, those sensors have to communicate in the precision time. In the current situation in 4G, there are limitations that you cannot communicate, communicate with the backend system in a, in, a, in a defined time frame because latency becomes a very prevalent thing in the current system. 5G is going to take care of that latency. The moment you have an information, it is transferred back to the recipient. The right information to the right person at the right time is going to be the code for 5G to be adopted very well in the smart city sector. We are talking about outcome. This is going to be useful because you are going back to the citizen saying that I can, we can deliver you the service. We can give you the input that you require instantly rather than waiting for things to happen. Just imagine a case when you have to integrate fire, ambulance and medical uh, services. How do you integrate and how do they work collaboratively at the time of mishap, at the time of disaster? If the, they do not connect with, them, with each other on a real time basis and the information has to flow within that split second or within, within few minutes. This is where the 5G is going to be very useful. If we can contextualize the uses of 5G in the, in the actual use case, which are practical use cases or the urban problem that we are facing today, we only address that rather than going to augmented realities, not going to the remote surgery, not going to autonomous, autonomous car because they are going to be distant dream for some time. Augmented reality might be have to some extent, but not other, other thing that we are talking about. I think if we can address those opportunity plus, that means what is there today, can we make it more efficient for us? I think 5G will become very, very useful. I'm a big fan of 5G, by the way. But what happens is that it comes at a cost. India is going to spend $100 billion in the next five to seven years. It is the true fact. We are going to be bound by this fact. And we are going to have a lot of spending on this, uh, getting the rural also connected. If you see the national data communication policy, which is under draft stage at this point of time, 2018, it talks about enhancing the life of the people through a digital empowerment. Now, people does not mean urban. People mean everybody who exists on the earth, on the earth in Indian geography. We are talking about inclusivity. Shared prosperity means two things, economic um, uh, impact, and second, inclusivity. I think this is where 5G is going to be impacting a little bit to the larger section of society. I think this is where I'll see. Going to the possibility minus, this is where we have to be very careful about. Augmented reality, uh, the, the cars, remote surgery, there are so many cases. I think industrial sector or the manufacturing segment has embraced 5G or the AI or other uh, machine learning things very well. I think we have to take a clue from that fourth industrial revolution uh, aspect. They have done it very well. The, the, the provider of technology have done it really well. That is where this, uh, this 5G will be very useful when you're connecting multiple manufacturing plant VG to deliver a service or the product at a, in a defined time frame. But it's going to be very cut through competition market. Thank you so much. Thank, can I add? Yeah, I mean, just, just to, you know, just 
taking a cue from and then I can sort of ask sure. Neil. Um, we have now heard the vision about the vision but I think there are people in this room who probably would be thinking about the, the challenges. Um, so, you know, I can, I can think of Neil, you know, sort of incorporating IOTs, I can think of Eric licensing, regulators, so on and so forth. So I'll let you speak on the challenges based on the vision that we have. Yes, yeah, so uh, I want to be very direct on which of the areas IoT will have a very prominent presence. So from a consumer, we are seeing there'll be huge and immense interest on healthcare and home automation. These are the two big areas which will have a big impact. So once 5G and IoT comes in, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, or augmented reality is a bit of a far, far cry. If you talk to any CEO, CFOs, they are primarily focusing on IoT. And this is, I'm, I'm not giving you uh, from what I can look into the internet, this is what we feel when we go to a customer. And a, a direct example is Hitachi in Gujarat. When we met them, they are heavily uh, investing. Sorry, I'm getting a bit distracted because um, Hitachi comes in the business sector. Let me first focus on two areas. Consumers, uh, healthcare, uh, personal health, and uh, big time on home automation. Now going to business, there are three areas. We are seeing there will be a big, big um, uh, applications coming in. First is automation, uh, auto, uh, automotive company. The second one is Industry 4.0. And Hitachi is already talking to us regarding how they can automize it. And, uh, and the third area we are, we are, we, we, I can vouch you, it will be big time, is BMS, Building Management System. They want all the air cons, the ducts, the pumps, all connected. Mm -hmm. These are the three areas we s will see will be, there are other areas, even, even healthcare as well. Like in Australia, there's a big push on government to, let's say if I am 85 years old, and uh, there's always a, a issue with uh, me going to the hospital because it puts a lot of pressure on the health system. They want my blood pressure to be monitored at home. So they want to push it back to, uh, back to home. They don't want the um, hospital to be crowded. That's a, different, uh, that's a different application altogether. But as I mentioned, the three things, um, once again, the BMS, the um, uh, Industry 4.0, and uh, 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 automotive company, these are the three areas will be, will be big. Eric, the challenges. Well, I think the challenge is who's going to pay for all of it and how they're going to pay for it. Um, uh, that's really where I'm, I'm unclear about 5G. I, I can see now some we have uh, in, in, in IoT, we have this patent pool called Avanci that is uh, putting together the patent portfolios of Qualcomm, Ericsson, Nokia, four or five other companies, offering a pool license for right now connected cars, which is probably the simplest part of IoT to approach. It's, it's also the most immediate one, so it makes sense. Um, and I like that model in a lot of ways, but I see that that model is not going to fit a connected toaster or a connected air duct. Um, and, and, and on top of that, I, I see that, that as an engineer, I think, okay, what's the next level of this? If I have, if I have connected toasters and connected washing machines and, and dishwashers, well then, I should be able to regulate their use. I should be able to control their use to, to sort of manage peak power demands on the, gr the, the electric grid, which has enormous benefit for everybody. But how do, we, how do we get there? How do we work out all the details of that? I, I, I really don't have any idea right now. I'm sorry to say. <clears throat> I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that, you know, uh, 5G will come or will be given to you. But I think uh, Eric alluded to a very important point. Eventually, who is going to pay for it? And I think we need to recognize one very important thing that, and again, I speak about India, but it applies to most other places. The government is not a significant player anymore in the creation of telecom infrastructure. It just is not, okay? Now, as of now, it's 
companies own less than 10% of market share in terms of infrastructure. Theirs is actually probably in, the, in a relatively poor state compared to their competitors. Now, the point, therefore, I'm, uh, that I'm making is that all this will have to happen through private investments. Okay? And recall, and this is my slightly uh, cheeky answer to your 5G will come, will be given to you. If you recall the, uh, the, way, uh, the, the time when Indian mobile services began in 95, 96, uh, now you had at least three or four years of the market just refusing to take off, right? The services were virtually unaffordable. They used to cost 16 rupees a minute, not just to make calls, but even to receive them. Okay? You also had a situation where theoretically the service was available, but in practice nobody was able to use it. Right? And it took serious regulatory changes for this market to change when things were put in place in 1999-2000. And you will find that if you look, and this is almost uh, classical uh, regulation in, in uh, you know, it's a very standard picture that you will see in regulatory documents. If you look at how regulation has impacted the growth of mobile telephony in India, you will f certainly not miss one very important point in my humble opinion, which is that the, not just the growth of, but even the coming of 5G in India is a highly, uh, is, a, is an issue that regulators will decide. It will not come otherwise. What we are talking about is the functionality of 5G. Of, of course we know what the functionality is. We know what all it can do and we also know that, you know, it's early days yet and we'll discover many, many more uses. But this infrastructure will come in only if there is a business case to do so. And, my, and that business case, to a large extent, in an infrastructure, particularly in telecom infrastructure, is driven by the, the, the nitty-gritty of regulation. And in India, I was arguing and I'm not the only one arguing this, that I think a lot of regulatory fixes will be required before you actually have investment in 5G infrastructure. So that, uh, I think, is, is the, uh, the, uh, my answer to your point about 5G will come, we will just use it. In fact, it may well come. Technically, you might get some place in Gurgaon which, has, which provides you 100 GB a second. You may well have uh, some, player, some fancy hospital somewhere which offers you remote uh, medicine. But that is not the same thing as 5G will come, right? I mean, if we want a reasonably high or reasonably widespread pervasive use of 5G, we will need 5G in a far more dispersed fashion across uh, the country, etc. And the uh, <clears throat> we, we, we must recognize that almost all experts today, particularly those uh, companies that think of invest, uh, in 5G, are always looking at use cases. In fact, even internationally, it is exceptionally early days yet for 5G. There are, there are, even the number of 5G networks today is statistically insignificant in my humble opinion. Correct. Exactly. This is precisely the point, distinction I am making. This is precisely this. We are not talking about the technology. We are not talking about its capability. We are not talking about the massive changes it will cause. No dis uh, uh, dispute on that. What I am saying is the actual physical deployment of networks is a different issue because eventually that will be done. And I don't say it's difficult just like that. Because for purely historical reasons, this will now have to be done by people who are private people who are commercially driven. So unless they have a business case, you will not have those networks. And that is why you have so few even internationally. The Ericsson point, the Nokia point, the Huawei point is well made. 
and uh, I'm not even arguing that this will not happen eventually. It will happen, hopefully. And, but I'm saying, recall the mobile experience in India, and, the, and it's not as if we were the first to deploy uh, mobile phones, despite the fact that there was a significant amount of experience with mobile phones. We got it badly wrong for a good five, six years. In fact, the, the, uh, today we, close to, we have close to a billion uh, connections. We didn't even have four million in 2001, six years afterwards. So there is a, a, an issue there. And as I said, I mean, let me uh, be again very open. If there is no spectrum auction, where on earth will you get 5G? Who will, uh, how do you deploy it without uh, access to spectrum? Now, will, uh, will that auction take place? Will, uh, will those uh, numbers be attractive enough to players? I mean, these are all very, very real-life issues. So I'm not uh, at all disagreeing with you on the, the, fun the functionality, the, the, the huge power of 5G technologies, of course, and we are all looking forward to it. But this, is not a, this is not an argument against 5G. This is about whether we will make those changes in time to ensure that investments take place in the network so that we can all use the service. Can Actually, I add uh, just a small pointer here, just quick one, just to take the thread uh, further from Dr. Uh, Opal. There are two, uh, to the best of my n understanding and uh, information, there are two work which is parallelly going on in this area. One is, this is a task force by COAI which has been already put in place, which is looking at three aspects of 5G rollout from the regulatory perspective. One is economic ability, uh, economic and, uh, economics of the 5G. The second is the time by which it will be deployed. Third is the utility. Mm. I think the task force is expected to do certain, certain actions which you have already highlighted, and that those are sensitive actions. CUAI Se is, a, is an industry association. Yeah, yeah. that's so correct. I mean, it's but, but their, their no, recommendation it go. Do, uh, these things. I agree, yeah. they don't mandate, but yeah. they would bring in the, the, they will bring in this issue at a, at a level when it can be discussed and concluded, because they will bring in the recommendation or findings out of these aspects. Hmm. No, Second, I think, sorry to interrupt. I mean, if that point is even better made by the fact that the government of India already had a very high level 5G committee. Yeah. It also, the TRAI as uh, Dr. That's what I was coming to the second one. Has moment. raised all those issues. But as I said, the, what we need answers to are answers of interest to investors. Agreed. And so that, uh, those answers we still don't have. I'm not suggesting that those answers will never come. But as of now, we don't. And yeah. at least the industry certainly is uh, across the board. And this is, and remember also that the, and this is what I was hinting at in the earlier uh, this thing, that, for example, the Airtels, the Vodafones, or the uh, Geos are one set of players. But if you want 5G functionality, you will need a whole lot of niche players, right? Do we have the, is our regulatory regime tuned for that? My answer is currently not. Even if the, even the appetite is also not there. Exactly. Try to do so, that. So that is my. Answer. I haven't said so. I understood that, but I was just highlighting it for the uh, the purpose of the larger audience. Two things. One is HLF, which you just mentioned about TRAI doing that. They they created a high level forum, which is which is constituting three different uh, committees within which they, they are trying to assess the condition of readiness of India. Uh, with respect to 5G. Obviously, the, the deterrent remains in terms of license, whether th that auction will happen or not, because everybody is backing out at this point of time. It is just too, too absorbent. 4.9, I think, lex crore is too much for any, any auction purpose. And this, I think, combination of COI and, uh, and the HLD of uh, TRA, I think they will bring in some clarity as to how we are moving forward. As I said earlier in the first mark, 5G is going to be given to you sooner or later, but it will come. 2020 let's, is the target. PM himself is very keen on getting this yeah, on board. So let's see how it translates. Really you will get it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll hear I from would like Chichu. to add to these challenges, which actually comes from your discussion that one is regarding that prohibitive nature of, in terms of finances and economics of it. So even a research paper by Qualcomm says that if you want to implement it because there are very few players and because you don't have the regulatory setup, 
actually what you're trying to is to reduce the urban rural divide but because of your royalty and other charges, it will increase the rural urban divide because right now even within smart cities proposed mission, your actual 80% of the investments for the smart provisions are within three to 10% of the area of the urban cities, which is your central business district. Now, this is the one dimension. Now, second dimension is that when it is cross cost prohibitive in nature and there are a few players in the market, your net neutrality will take a hit. Because now you are free to introduce in multiple medias, like earlier Alka discussed about that, what happens to Netflix, what happens to Woot. They have different uh, censoring pattern or censoring policies. YouTube has a completely different censoring policy. So you need to now have more censoring policies as well as more net neutrality policies with what happens to the data which is being projected inside the car? What happens to the data which is on the screen of your washing machine or something on your toaster? Third thing is that, which no one is right now talking about, with all this teledensity and the sensor and who is going to fund the energy? Where is the energy going to come from? The teledensity which re is required for 5G is four times the of 4G. You need more towers, and you know more micro towers, okay? All of this 5G is based on uninterrupted power supply. Where is this power is going to come from? Your batteries are not efficient enough to run for a lifetime kind of thing. So how you are going to maintain, what is the operational perspective of it? Which as of now, no one is talking about. At least from the Indian perspective, we are not good at even maintaining a smaller infrastructure. Our infrastructure is not even 1G per se. Now you're talking about maintaining a 5G infrastructure whose basic premise is that it needs 24 seven uninterrupted power supply. How we are going to do that? The moment something is off the grid, your grid will not work because then it works very much on the network theory that any sector, any area is not working. So power needs, energy needs to be considered as one of the largest challenge which no one is talking about. add here is for sure there will be no, nothing can be of a global policy in terms of licensing or in terms of you know uh, data privacy it will all be something like a best practice and there will be a lot of carve out i think that discussion is fairly clear among wto members that they would retain their sovereign right to regulate so uh, Having said that, that's kind of developed country, developing country have an equal opinion. So they can give a best practice regime, mostly like the telephone uh, reference paper kind of a thing that is the maximum that uh, a global regulatory regime can achieve. Now coming to India, we have three or four core problems which we touched upon but we did not highlight. One is, the, one is that we are today it is at a state when where the government is investing a lot of money in some kind of social schemes. Our exports are down, our economy is down. We have a huge population to feed and we really have, do not have jobs and our manufacturing are one of the lowest in terms of technology adaptation. When in this time, we, we did a survey recently and we found that, you know, textile industry or apparel industry have lower uh, technology adaptation than even Bangladesh. And uh, last year we lost, 60, uh, Cambodian export was 70%, we lost it. But these are, these are all new in the newspaper, but this is the fact. Now, one Hitachi in Gujarat and one Ericsson in somewhere Gurgaon is not India. Now, if we come to crusk of India, the crusk of India, there is no policy. The government has no clarity on how to, it, it gives, if, and if you calculate all the subsidies that the government gives, today you are giving 300 or subsidies, yet you, there is no make in India and manufacturing. And everybody this time also Apple, uh, as we discussed today, wrote a letter that I cannot locally source my part, so I want to delay my manufacturing. So wherever you are giving them concessions, and what you are giving, uh, what, how are you doing your deals with international organizations? You told Apple to do 30% local sourcing, yet they can bring in second-hand products. So the second-hand product is coming, 30% local sourcing, they write, we cannot do. So many things that we are asking for in the name of make in India, Bharat own is very different from, uh, you know, what the global policies are, is all about. The 
second thing is coming to australia in a country like australia where the population is very low and the population can be far faced and they will not be having access to hospital they have access to technology it is easier to technologically communicate australian doctors when they came and sat in the indian hospital see doctor when the government talked about health stack and planning commission came out with a report the australian doctor says we feed in the information so it is up to us how i get the information i feed in the information there the data is so private that even if i have to share my wife's data with my friend who is a doctor i have to take my wife's written permission so systems are in place i am say, sharing the daughter the, of this thing he came and sat with us in aims and gangaram and he says oh god i see 20 patient a day a maximum on a heavy day here the doctor sees 100 patient a day i see a patient for one and a half years uh, half hours this guy sees it for you know 5 minutes now it is good that the guy is able to predict and it is amazing that the patient is alive But <laughs> I will never be able to enter this data. So you put Australia in India, they will not be able to do it. In district hospital, we did a mapping of all these health stack and all these smart and whatever shared prosperity. Half of the UP does not have a single computer. Yeah, you are talking about universal health care, and you are talking about you are thinking that if it is a universal health care, insurance will push the hospitals to upload, right? but you go to your big hospital chains in india you go to max you ask mass whether they have when did they actually put in the EMR, uh, uh, patient record system EMR, uh, so it's this year last year trial you know so you know the thing is like this india will adopt india will not adopt because last year when the hospitals were told that they have to bring down the prices of stents etc etc they decided to pull out the budget out of it they never decided they will not do other activities like extension of bed and things like that so here you are talking about companies to do a massive investment in it technology infrastructure at their individual end to fit into something which is a global network or a country level network now if they have to do that uh, uh, they have to have a strategy like when we talk about use of iot in the uk they say that okay i have divided my product into high risk product and low risk product high risk product for me is meat therefore i will implement blockchain in meat i will bring in cognizant to do the job for us when we talk about high risk and low risk product our uh, uh, food uh, fssa say high, high risk product is actually alcohol which is preservative but uh, given that it is preservative it is not high risk anymore you know so therefore they have to now go back to the product classification they have to determine how with the product classification the data is shared so if the government really has to go to 5g first they have to first share data between custom and fssai custom and this body so if intergovernmental data sharing is not there i'll tell you please go ahead and get a small data money you can do smart cities non smart cities try to get a data on export of public sector enterprise that's a government data right you just for, try to find it out anonymous data i just need total exports of power. and ask babul shipriyo to find it out if he gets the data out of commerce ministry within 7 days i rest my case I, <laughs> because we are doing this job with them they are not getting the data we did interview i i think i think that's it's it's an interesting sort of you know point but i think moving to you know the discussion on i think one of the important issues that came up you know during the course of the this discussion is what is happening with our data um we have talked about uh managing data we've talked about channeling data we have talked about transmitting data controlling data sovereign data non sovereign data a uh, democratization of data what is you know how do we see as how do, how do we see data security in india in terms of how do you want to manage data security in india so far as um you know 5g or smart cities you know technology where a lot of data sharing is happening this okay <coughs> data is new oil people are talking about why do they talk it is new oil it actually is a crude oil new oil is not in the f- not new oil in the in the crude form is what we call data and data has information it's if it is extracted very well it becomes petrol or diesel otherwise it is just good for nothing coming to the perspective of security there are two things which are happening at this point of time uh, from the regulation and the privacy perspective one is there's a policy called ndsap 
national data um, uh, sharing and accessibility policy, Department of Science and Technology, which is already released about in, uh, it's about, I think it's about seven years old and then going through iteration. And, and uh, it has been adopted, it is expected to be adopted by the, uh, by the department across. Uh, and it talks about anonymization of data, it talks about the, the sensitive data, it's about critical data, it can be, it's a data which can, which can be freely used. All this uh, uh, classification has been done by the NDCEP policy. Second thing which is happening at this point of time is the, uh, I'm sure many of you would be aware, is the Sri Krishna Committee <coughs> on Data Privacy Act, the Privacy Act. I think that's currently under deliberation. It should have been passed in the last uh, parliament session, but it did not happen. It's going to be soon. So that is talking about in big details about how you define data, who is the custodian of data, who is, uh, how the data is to be treated, if it data has to be reused, what kind of clearances and the, and the approvals are required from the individual or from the businesses. I think these two things, when they combine together, will get a little more clarity how the data will be processed through its life cycle. In smart cities, what we are doing is uh, that we have understood that data is going to be very, very important asset for uh, urban uh, uh, transformation. Because if we are not able to use effectively the, the potential that data brings in, I think our purpose of being smart is already lost. That two, four things will happen from data. Data, uh, data will transform into information, information will transform into maybe knowledge, to knowledge to wisdom. I think this is the transition that data is going to have. It, it brings that kind of potential. We are, we are, what we are trying to do is to build capacity at the city level at each city level to understand the importance of data and how to secure the data. At least become a custodian of data. Don't freely use it or don't freely uh, share it with anybody and everybody without knowing the consequences. I think that sensitization is currently happening. The rules are being made parallelly. I think today, uh, if you talk about data a year before, not many people were actually aware of how to treat data. They thought that data is free. Data is just that an outcome of an action. And it's just lying there for you to really, or it perishes over a period of time because the importance get lost once it loses the time cycle. But today, the, the, the data is being treated as very, very important commodity and asset in the smart city specifically, That's, since we are exposed quite deep inside that. This, and there are city data officers that have been appointed in each smart city as we speak today. So there are 100 city data officers who are working to see that how they can manage the data of that particular city. There would be rules, there would be regulation, there would be some kind of privacy uh, program that each city will run because you have to contextualize that data repository also at the city level. So we come out, we have asked the cities to come out with the city data policies, which will take into account all kind of current regulation. I think they are not enough, but definitely there are uh, regulation which are going to come into effect. We are going brick by brick. Um, uh, only taking the NDSF policy as the baseline today with some contextualization at the city level. But yes, it has a lot of potential to refine. It has got a lot of, lot of areas that are still a gap that is to manage. I think understanding and awareness, we talked about awareness, uh, understanding and awareness is one big question. That and, and, the, and, and, and on top of it, I think ownership has become such an important issue that as a government of any government officer, the moment you say that you're on, you are, you are owner or the accountable for this, he takes two steps back. I think that uh, privacy policy talks about the person who is the custodian. If he releases the data, he becomes under the act, he is liable to be um, prosecuted as an individual. I think this is very important aspect that which needs to be handled carefully so that people or the custodian feel more secured and happy to exercise that control. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, see, basically in the WTO there is definitely a debate about the data data security and data policy. And the debate, the problem in India is un, unlike many European countries that, you know, Europe has the GDPR. And after the GDPR, which is a kind of a flat bed that has been created, then you have more sensitive data. So you can come out with your health related data policy or finance related data policy. India has looked at the whole thing from a very different angle. So it has been, everybody has a data policy. 
So RBI has a data policy. Health sector also came out with a DISHA. Now you are having every city has a data policy. Just imagine the ease of doing business for a company which operates a technology across multiple cities. It is a nightmare for him to have a city level policy. How can the government even think of such a thing? Like a city level policy. It can be a policy for certain. Now you are talking about a data privacy, a policy of using citizen data. Now that has to be a general data policy. And that has to be clarified. What is a data? What is a carve out? What is a policy? But that still the Justice Sri Krishna committee was doing that in the e-commerce policy it is not done. Unfortunately WTO discusses it under the e-commerce policy. WTO has taken a trade facilitation route to plurilateral negotiation because Doha round is uh, dead. They have also taken e-commerce as a route after the trade facilitation and we are plugging in information within the e-commerce policy. Huh? So the e-commerce policy will be what happens to Uber data, what happens to Amazon data. So we are talking about private sector data. And because it is WTO, it really does not talk about a data generated by the government. It talks about data generated by the private sector and government access to the data. So I'll just give you an example. Suppose if I do a murder and I run away, whether the police will be able to see my Google email. Today it cannot and that is what they would be trying to generate through their data policies that is access for certain governance within a certain framework. So now that is very important for us to understand that what data is generated, how it is protected, what is shared. And I think that is where if you look into all the definitions, none of the Indian, if you put all the policies and the definitions together, India is the only one country that doesn't even define it. Every ministry has a different definition. And that is where the problem is. Uh, and but uh, I'll not take time. Uh, when we talked about city data policy, let me clarify, it is not about every city having a different policy. It is only contextualization to the local policy, that's all. Maybe 5%, 10% change to the overall program. Mm -hmm. The overall program under NDSAP or the Data Privacy Act that comes in place, that will be followed as it is because we are not going to change at the mission level and uh, to the city level. The only thing that changes is that a city may decide, because the NDSI policy allows that provision, city may decide that which data they have to categorize as the sensitive data, which data they have to categorize as open data, through an open data portal they can share information. Mm -hmm. Like you said that this data is very difficult to get the commerce ministry data for how much export has been done. I think sooner or later this is also going to come in because NIC has come out with the open data portal, a smart city has come out with the open data portal. If you go to the website, a lot of data is getting populated there freely and every, anybody can use it. I think the change is happening. The change is happening slowly, but it's happening now. I think sooner, next time when we meet, probably you'll have a commercial data, commercial uh, department data available to you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, you know, this one and a half hours, essentially, we have overshot the time by 20 minutes or so. Um, and there are a number of questions that we probably have not answered, but I think that's a good sign. That essentially means that we have to discuss a lot more before the deployment even after the deployment happens. Um, thank you again, you know, to the panelists. Um, I think I'll now pass on the microphone to my dear colleague Vishwas to summarize and sort of do the honors. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, what we can actually do, we can have questions, interactions, you know, while having dinner. Yeah. yeah. So I take this opportunity to thank all the panelists for making it uh, for the panel discussion today. And uh, I'd also take this opportunity to thank uh, quite a few of my Jiriko colleagues, uh, Isha to begin with, uh, to all the research associates in uh, Jiriko, um, to Navreet, uh, to our graphic designer, Ranjan, and uh, to Rajiv and uh, quite a few others that I'm missing out here uh, for putting up this particular and enabling this particular panel discussion to happen. Thank you. No. Uh, I'd like to call upon uh, my colleagues Avirup, Manveen, uh, Srijit and uh, Indra, 
Ashish is missing, uh, to, uh, to facilitate our panel discussions today. Uh, it's a small token of appreciation from our end. To Dr. Alka Chavla, Dr. Mahesh Uphal, Manveen. Okay. Avirup, Mahesh Upar. Indra Padam. Thank you. 